Welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Mikkel Thorpe. This is the Expat Money Show. And today it is episode 150. Holy moly. I can't believe we are now at episode 150. That is just mm, crazy to me. Mind-blowing, honestly. I started this podcast about five years ago now and have had so many amazing guests over the years. And we're celebrating. I mean, 150 episodes. That is unreal. I read once that the statistics for podcasts is something like 80% of podcasts don't make it past episode number seven. So we've certainly uh, hit that milestone and gone a lot further. So today I am in Brazil. Um, You guys are probably going to hear the wind blowing and the ocean in the background. I've decided to film this one on my balcony. We've been in Brazil for about six months now and we're getting ready to leave. We've got about another week left. We're going to start packing everything up and then heading home to Panama. So it's been a pretty emotional, pretty intense last six months. So I guess before we kind of get into my experiences in Brazil and what has happened here, just a few housekeeping things and some stuff I want to tell you guys about before we jump into everything. But stay tuned. There's there's a lot to tell in this episode. So the first thing that I want to mention to you is YouTube. We have started our first YouTube channel, our new YouTube channel. Someone might say, well, didn't you already have stuff on YouTube? Well, we were taking random videos and we were throwing up the video onto YouTube just to host the video. But it wasn't a YouTube channel. I didn't put any time or energy or effort into it. It wasn't something that I was doing on a regular basis. Now we are putting out multiple videos a week. We started off by putting out videos of our experiences here in Brazil, and those have been really good with great feedback. And now we're also putting out some interviews that we've done on the podcast, and we're putting out the video content for it. So I think it's going to be really good. We're going to be able to play with lots of new things. I've got lots of ideas and creative stuff I want to do, but you guys are going to have to give me feedback. You have to tell me what it is you like, what it is you don't like, how you want it to go, length of video, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I believe that feedback is a gift. So first step is you have to go and subscribe to the YouTube channel. So the easiest way is to either search us on YouTube, search for Expat Money or search for my name, Mikkel Thorpe. Or if you want to be even easier, just go to expatmoneyshow.com forward slash YouTube forward slash YouTube, and that will redirect you directly to our subscription page for our YouTube channel. Subscribe there. And then I want you to start commenting on the videos, uh, giving us some feedback, telling us what you like, what you don't like. It's really interesting too, because my wife is doing all of the video editing for us. So we're really making this a family affair and she's getting involved. So now she's starting to learn a lot about my guests and everything like that. She's traveled so much in her life as well. And she's been an expat for 12 or 13 years, something like that. So it's nice that she's joining the family. Uh, Well, she's part of the family, but joining the the work family as well. So I I like that a lot. So give her some support. uh, Give her a thumbs up and the likes. Give her some some encouragement because we're all learning here. We're all trying to do the best. It's our goal to put out the best expat content in the world. And for that, we need your help. This is a community. This isn't one directional. This isn't forward facing only. We expect you guys to participate and subscribe and do all these types of things. Because if you guys don't like the content or it doesn't make sense for you, well then it doesn't make sense for me to make it. Because I only want to put out stuff that you guys want to listen to and watch and read, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, if you go to expatmoneyshow.com forward slash YouTube, you're going to be able to subscribe there. And it's really good. We're really excited about it. Number two is our Facebook group, our Facebook page. Um, Facebook group is growing very fast. I mean, we must be getting 40, 50 people a day who are joining us there. That's amazing. That's insane. And a lot of people have some really interesting questions, some really interesting points. There's lots of discussion going back and forth, lots of friendships and networking being done. So this is amazing. So if you guys want to join Expat Money Forum, then all you need to do is either go to Facebook and search us on there, or you can go to expatmoneyforum.com, expatmoneyforum.com, and it will redirect you to to the page. There's a couple of questions in there. Just quickly fill them out. I go through every single person who applies. So please do fill them out. Um, 
I limit the people that come in because I only want serious people. I'm not looking for spammy people. This is not a place to go and sell your stuff or to list your property or tell about some new uh, crypto token or something, airdrop. I mean, there's none of this type of thing here. So this is all about expat and expat hopefuls, building your network, getting your questions answered, and it's moderated. We have four moderators in the group, including myself. So we're constantly looking at the posts every day, and if it's spammy or if it doesn't follow the rules, then that person is gone because we're not looking for a spam place. We're looking for a solid community. So expatmoneyforum.com, you guys can join that. All right, next, housekeeping, housekeeping. Okay, we have started our own school. It is a uh, middle school and high school. It is called Expat International School. I've done two quick emails about it. Just trying to gauge your interest for your families. If this is something that you are want or don't want, um, it's going to be really amazing. I'm really stoked about this. The feedback that we've gotten has been unreal. There's so many people asking how they can help out, how they can donate, how they can get involved. I have not just parents, you know, my kids, you know, my kid is 10 years old. I want them to join, but also parents who are like, we're giving birth next month and we want to keep in touch about this so that in eight years when our kids go to school, we're prepared for these types of things. We have a lot of people who are grandparents who want this for their kids. They're, sorry, their grandkids. I think that that's amazing because it really shows you that what we're building is something really special. So, so you have a little bit of an understanding about it is... We are not state-sponsored. It will not be state-run programs. It is going to follow really libertarian values. And I say that as libertarian uh, with a lowercase l. We have no political um, affiliations. This is not a political matter whatsoever. When I talk about libertarianism, it's never political. Um, it's economic. It's philosophical. It's spiritual. It's mental. It's, it's looking for an alternative and following some really simple and easy to under guidelines. Do not encroach on other people or their property and do all that you say you will do. If you follow these two types of things or these two things make sense to you, then you or your kids or your grandkids probably have a place in this school. Now you would think that that's a very obvious thing, but actually it's not. Once you start learning about it and you start learning about how organizations or governments or states encroach on these rights, it actually happens all the time all over the place. And the main place that I saw that when I was a child was in state-run schools. So if you guys have been listening to my work for any length of time, I'm sure you know my story, but I will quickly repeat it for you if you are new here. So when I was a small child, I was di diagnosed with a learning disability. And what happened was the, the teacher pulled me out of class one day. I was in grade three. And they pulled me out of class and they took me to a special room and there was the the principal and the vice principal and like a resource teacher i remember very clearly and and my teacher so like three four adults and me and i'm like okay i'm not a huge guy right now but i was like a really small kid when i was uh when i was young i was always the smallest kid so i was like very intimidated and they told me that there was something wrong with my brain that my brain did not work correctly and what they wanted to do was send me to a special school, special school for special boys. So side note, this doesn't work right brain is dyslexia. It's, it's a type of dyslexia. We now know, uh, you know, 30 some odd years later that dyslexia is not really that big of a deal. It's actually very common. It happens all the time. If you're behind in reading and writing or your kids are behind in reading and writing, um, there's just different ways that kids can learn things. Anyways, they sent me to this special school. But it actually was not a special school. It was a regular school with a special class. So I got in fights like tons. I got picked on. I got bullied. Probably you guys can see in the video or see in any of my pictures. I still have a big bump in my nose. This is from fighting when I was a kid. Uh, I had my nose broken. I was in the hospital a couple of times. I had my teeth knocked out. Um, it was a pretty horrendous experience. And, I, and I'm getting a little bit more graphic here as opposed to, you know, being a guest on someone else's show because I, I want to be very upfront and, and uh, honest with you guys. It was, um, it was a brutal experience. I really hated it. Uh, I used to come home from school every day crying. I begged to not go back to this school. And there was 
so much like psychological and, and mental baggage that I carried forth with me as an adult. Anyways, uh, after three years, I got a chance to go back to my neighborhood school with my neighborhood friends. And I was in a really, I grew up in a well-to-do neighborhood. All the parents were like doctors and lawyers and stuff like that. My family was pretty normal. You know, my father uh, was a, um, a mailman and my mother was a real estate agent. I think at this point, probably my parents were separated, maybe dis- divorced by that time. But we didn't have a lot of money. My parents worked very hard. They, they loved me very much and they spent a lot of their effort to put me in a good neighborhood with a good school. So anyways, I get to go back to my neighborhood school and I thought, wow, this is going to be amazing. Uh, my friends will have missed me so much. They're going to be so excited to see me, etc., etc., etc. But they didn't. It was like pretty brutal. I mean, I had a couple of good friends and a couple of the friends still today. I have a friend, Adam, who I've known for since I was five years old or something like that. He's still a very good friend of mine. Same with a friend, John. I've known him for 35 years. Really great people. But there was a lot of people in the classes who I didn't get along with. And um, I stopped going to school. And when I stopped going to school or I start cutting class, then I would start to fail. So then they'd send me to summer school and then I'd fail summer school. And then somehow I'd squeak into the next year and then I'd fail that. Well, I got into high school and failed, failed, failed. I was like, 40%, 50%. And once again, it's not because I'm not smart. I'm very smart. I have 147 IQ. They actually tested it when I was a child to make sure that my learning disability wasn't actually a problem with my intelligence. I'm very intelligent, but because of the dyslexia, I had all these problems with uh, the way that they were teaching. In state-run schools, they follow what's called rote learning, so rote memorization. So they'll teach you something and basically you put it in your short-term memory and then you do a test on it and then it's gone. This did not work well for me at all. I learned through experiences. I learned through mentorship by understanding things, by doing things with my own hands. Uh, just look at the business, the podcast, the newsletter, the blog, the all of these things that I do. I do them because of the my own experiences here. So... I stopped going to school when I was about 12 years old and I officially dropped out when I was 15. And then that was it. I started traveling internationally a year or two later and I started learning in very different ways. I'm not going to go into, you know, my whole story, my backstory of traveling. I mean, if it's 149 other episodes that we talk about those types of things, the 150th episode, we're going to go forwards. We're going to talk about some of the other stuff. So I had a a really bad experience with education um, and I had a lot to overcome in my life because of this. A lot of mental blocks and false belief patterns that have taken me years and years to go through. I mean, 20, 30 years to get through a lot of this stuff. I'm in an extremely good spot right now and have been for the last, say, 10 years or something like that. I'm happily married. I have two children. um, I have a great group of friends. I have a successful business. You know, we do very well for ourselves in our business uh, through consulting, through uh, helping people to move offshore, all the things that we talk about on this podcast. But education has been a really big passion of mine because I never want to see what happened to me, any other child to have to go through. I think that it is a crime the way that they did these types of things. Um, I don't think it's my parents' fault. I don't think that it was done maliciously in a lot of these cases. I think that there were just a lot of mistakes made. And uh, I don't want to sit here and complain about stuff. That's not my style. I don't just sit around and whinge about things and wish and hope and cross my fingers that stuff will be better. I want to actually be a solution. And for me, this is my difference with libertarianism as well. I've had my clients and subscribers uh, compliment me before saying, finally, a libertarian who actually presents solutions, not just uh, talking about the problems all day. This is not a dig on other libertarian podcasts. It's, uh, It's just a differentiating factor between my work and a lot of other people. I think that the other people, their work is very important, 
but I'm such an upbeat and happy person, I would rather just present you guys with the solutions. Because I figure you know what the, the problems are. You know what the problems are with government and with pharmaceuticals and all of these types of things and big education. Let's just try to figure out what the solution is. What's a better alternative so you can have more freedom, so your family can have more liberty in their life and do the things that make sense to you. Follow your belief patterns. Because I'm not here to tell you what your belief patterns should be. I just want you to, like I said, do all that you say will do and do not encroach on other people or their property. I think those are like two things that we can really all agree on. Everything else, you know, if it makes sense, you do you. That's, that's my mindset. Anyways, this school that we're going to be putting together is amazing. So I do not have a background in education. I don't have a background in teaching. I don't have a background in developing school programs, anything like that. But what I do have a background in is being an entrepreneur. So the whole name of the school, the long name, is Expat International School of Freedom and Entrepreneurship. Freedom is the libertarian angle, once again, not political, following those two values. And entrepreneurship is the critical thinking, the creativity, all of these types of things. So I have partnered with an amazing individual. His name is Michael Strong. He came on my podcast about a year ago and we became fast friends and started talk, talk, talking. And I appeared on his program. And there's so many things that we see eye to eye on. He runs currently a domestic school called the Socratic Experience. And I love the idea of the school. Uh, at the time, it was branded the it was branded Expanse. It's now been rebranded to the Socratic Experience. So it's a lot about a lot of uh, conversations about thought, conversations about topics, opposed to just small talk or things like that. They do STEM. They do uh, normal things that you would expect to see in a school, but it's not taught in the same way. It's really customized to the child's needs, to their learning, their, the way that the child learns, which would have been very helpful me, for me as a kid. Having a sip of coffee, sorry. So it will have a lot of those aspects to it from the Socratic experience that he's doing. It will have a lot of aspects from the libertarian side and the entrepreneur side, which I mentioned. But it's also a lot of the homeschooling, unschooling, world schooling mindset. So Michael described it to me first as uh, homeschooling by professionals or unschooling by professionals. Because I have kids, I homeschool my kids. This is the first program in the world where I was actually like, wow, I want my child to do this. Because I've never found anything else out there which really made sense for me. I've looked at libertarian uh, platforms, I've looked at other homeschooling curriculums, nothing ever made sense to me. First of all, a lot of those programs are video recordings, so like a recording of a lecture, then the child does a certain amount of homework or something like that. It's not how we're doing things. We're in groups of 15, the kids are in groups of 15 and they have a guide. We don't call them teachers, they're called guides. They're almost like a peer, but you know, 10 years or 20 years ahead. Um, then it's all done through video conferencing. So we do use Zoom, but we also use other types of platforms, which are a little bit more interactive. We have some uh, proprietary software that we're going to be unleashing for this. It's going to be really exciting. And we follow the normal, you know, nine to five type of curriculum or like time frame. So there'll be breaks, there'll be projects. You, the child doesn't have to stand in front of the computer all day long. They can go and do something like a science project and then come back and check in. But it's not just leaving them alone all day. So there is socialization. There is an opportunity for your child to find out, uh, to make friends, to find out more information, to ask questions in real time, to build relationships, to build all these types of things. So the Socratic experience is the domestic branch of... Michael's school. And now we've joint ventured, we've, we're 50-50 partnering, partnering on the Expat International School. And that will house all of the international clients. So another thing that people have to understand is when you move overseas, it can be kind of jarring for the kids. And what kept coming up over and over and over again with my clients was, you know, well, what are we going to do for school? What about the kids? It's all dependent on them. They have friends, etc., etc. So the, 
what can happen often is a family will move to a new country and they'll spend a couple of years there. Either the mom has a new job and they move for that, or the dad has a new job and they move for that, or they want to be digital nomads, they want to move on a regular basis, or they want to move to a country for two, three years, they run their own online business, but they get a taste for it. They get excited about it and want to go to another country. So if the child relocates once, maybe that's okay if they're going to spend the rest of their life there. So they spend the rest of their life in Costa Rica or Panama or Mexico or whatever it might be. But that second jump, that third jump, you know, then they lose touch with those same kind of kids. And the same experience that happened to me when I was with my neighborhood school, then went to another school, then came back, that can also be very jarring. So with this, the children doesn't matter which country they're going to be in, they're going to be able to have the same type of friends. They're going to be able to keep those same types of relationships going. So we're actually doing from the ages of 8 to 19, they're, the child can go from the junior high to middle school to high school and all the way through. They can follow with the same kids and then everything is shaped based on their needs. So there'll be elective classes and everything like this. We're going to have lots of programs that are going to uh, focus on things like blockchain, on artificial intelligence, on programming. So a lot of the, the things that will actually be applicable in future generations, not teaching kids skills for jobs that will not exist in five to ten years from now. There's going to be a lot of creativity, a lot of writing, a lot of communication, a ton on languages. So there'll be options for children learning multiple languages. So if your family is moving to Latin America, then there'll be certain amount of classes or specialized programs taught in Spanish or coming down to Brazil where I am today. There'll be Portuguese. There'll be other options for languages because this is such an important part of being an expat is the communication. Communication, friendship, uh, building relationships and all these entrepreneurial skills are going to be a huge, huge part of it. Anyways, for this, what I want you guys to do if you're interested, if you're curious about this, you can shoot me an email to mikel at expatmoney.io. This is my new work email address, mikel at expatmoney.io. I will send you more information. If you join my newsletter, then you will get a... Uh, a couple of generic things which are going to go out uh, talking about you know when we launch our website, which will hopefully happen in the next month or so, uh, so that you guys can actually go there and find out information on that. But if you actually are interested in enrolling on the coming school semester, then you can contact me at Mikkel, Mikkel at expatmoney.io, and I'll get you some information. We can schedule a phone call about that. Um, we're also doing continual intake. So even if your child is partway through a semester and doesn't like what is happening with the school, if they don't like wearing a mask, if they don't like the, the vaccinations or these mandates or kids going to school one day but not on the other day or having these, I don't know what's going on in the world right now. I'm not making any comments to that. You know, you do you once again. But if you don't like what's happening, you don't like the education system in your area, well, then you can start to think more globally. You can also think that maybe I'm not going to be an expat today, but I will be an expat in a year or two years or three years. And you want your child to start having that international experience right now from the beginning. Then I think that this is a great opportunity. It will also not be so jarring for them when they move. They'll already have something which is stable in their life. So that's, uh, that's what we have going on with the school. It's called Expat International School. I'm really excited about it. Find out more information, Mikkel at expatmoney.io. Soon we will have the new website. I'm going to send that out on the, the normal email newsletter. And then once you guys register, I'll send you more detailed information. You know, let me know because this might not be applicable if you don't have kids. If you don't have kids but you still want to get involved, if you want to donate some time or you think that you have a, a a project or a course or a you want to be a guest speaker or something like that then let me know i think that'll be amazing we'll try to organize something we're going to be doing some other really cool things last point about this i think i'm going to start doing my podcast live and i will do it with a like a live studio audience and the live studio audience will be the kids from the school so it will be a completely unedited it'll be streamed to the school and then at the end of the podcast the kids will be able to ask questions it's an idea i'm playing with i think it could be super powerful now whether we publish those questions or not we'll have to look at the permissions from the parents if they give their kids permission um, any type of 
if they have to sign off, you know, and probably like we wouldn't be giving out the kids full names or anything like that. We probably wouldn't be doing video with the kids. But, you know, uh, Tom, uh, American, lives in Panama, you know, asks this question or maybe get them on, ask the question to the guest and then have the guest answer. I think that that'll be really, really interesting. Then the kids will also be able to see how a podcast like mine gets made. The editing, the show notes, the graphics, the uh, how we find the guests, how we source it, how I develop the questions, how I interview them, how we market it, how we... Uh, put it up on social media, how we monetize it, how I make money from this, how I build relationships, how I stay in touch with them. The kids will get to see all of these types of things. That is an amazing educational experience. I mean, I do very well on this podcast. This is a successful podcast where I make a full-time living from podcasting. Uh, so think if you have a child and you want them to learn these types of skills, video editing, speaking, um, communication, languages, all these types of things. This might be a great option for them. Anyways, enough about that. We'll be moving on. I just want to really highlight it because I'm so passionate. I'm so excited about it. All right, Brazil. So why did we come to Brazil? Well, I've done a couple of episodes where I talked about going to Costa Rica to get the visa. Then I talked, I did an episode about coming into Brazil and what that was like. Uh, if you guys haven't heard them, I'll give you a very quick recap. So my wife and I just gave birth to our second child. We had a little boy. He was born in May and very happy, healthy. Mama is happy, healthy. Baby is happy, healthy. And we decided to give birth in Brazil. And we did this because we wanted to do birth tourism. And... Uh, it's a great opportunity for a lot of people. If you are an international family like ours and you don't have any reason to give birth in the country that you live in right now, you can look at birth tourism. I actually want to do maybe a special report or a book talking about this, listing all the details, not just for Brazil, but for other countries that do this. And there, there are other countries. We chose Brazil first because I, I love the country. This is my fifth time coming to Brazil. I think it's amazing. We wanted to start learning a little bit about the language. My daughter already speaks three languages fluently. She speaks English, Mandarin, and Spanish. We want to give her a fourth language. So, you know, having some ties to Brazil and learning Brazilian Portuguese, I think is going to be a great advantage for her. Also, by giving birth here, the child is automatically a Brazilian citizen. So I have a, my son is a Brazilian boy, Brazilian uh, citizen. Uh, he's also a Canadian citizen, and he also has permanent residencies and other citizenships, which I, are a separate conversation, but I'm not going to talk about that. I'm Canadian background, so that's why he has that one. So this is like a, a plus one. It's an, an added bonus. We would have had to pay in Panama for our giving birth anyways. We don't use the socialized medicine. We always pay either out of pocket or we pay for things with our insurance. We have international health insurance. If you guys go to expatmoneyshow.com forward slash insurance, you guys can find, about, find out about the company that I use for my family. They're really, really great. They do international plans. Um, very, very affordable. I think we pay like $6,000 a year for all the bells and whistles, platinum coverage, inpatient, outpatient, zero deductible, full medical, uh, full dental, uh, full drug plan, etc., etc., etc. And then, because we are the legal guardians of a Brazilian citizen, we automatically get our permanent residency. Well, automatically is not really correct. It's kind of a misnomer. So it doesn't like happen out of nowhere. You still have to apply for it, and there's a lot of paperwork that has to be done. Now, I work in immigration. I work with like immigration lawyers for a living. I talk about immigration all the time. I'm an immigration expert on many different countries. It's one of the main people, main thing that people come to me for. Um, I do taxes. I do other stuff. But the main thing that people want my advice about is citizenship, passports, immigration, residency, uh, migrating to other countries. Uh, I was surprised at how things work in Brazil with the bureaucracy, with uh, all this process. First of all, it doesn't make sense. There's things here that I've never seen in any other country. 
It's not something you ever want to do by yourself. We are working with a local service provider and they've even made a lot of mistakes and things were not as they expected, that things changed. We got told that we needed uh, my birth certificate in Canada, legalized in Canada before, from the Canadian government before being sent to the Brazilian consulate for them to legalize it. So we went through that whole process, which took an extra month and then when we sent it to the Brazilian consulate, they're like, no, there was no need to do this at all. It's a government document from Canada. It's already legalized. There's no reason to do this. So that might have been applicable for other countries. Maybe it's applicable for the UK or from the US, but for Canada, it wasn't applicable. I would have expected that that was covered and they would have known that and they didn't. There was three or four uh, things like that that put, th put us behind. Also, we were told that it would take about one or two weeks to get our appointment with the federal police to do our immigration process. Well, we got our appointment. It's for next year. So the wait times are almost a year to see uh, the federal police here. That is crazy. So now we actually have to book trips back to Brazil. I hope that they, because we've submitted all our documents online, that our apostilles are not going to expire when we get back. Like, apostilles only list, you know, a couple of months or maybe maximum six months for, say, a fingerprint or something like that, uh, that are normally accepted. But because they've accepted them online, all we have to do is go into the federal police, have a 60 minute meeting with them, then they stamp our passports, we get our permanent residency here, and now the t timer starts to tick for getting our citizenship. Uh, which is something that we would like to do in the future. Anyways, these are things that other people will never tell you, that other bloggers or podcasters or people in the industry, they'll never be this candid with you. They'll never be this upfront and, and honest. And it's, it's not because I don't think that they're honest or open. I mean, some of them are not. But a lot of it comes down to the fact that they don't know what they're talking about. A lot of people in this industry... Um, not trying to be rude, but they regurgitate what other people talk about. So they have an idea, they hear about something, then they'll maybe go out there and research it online, or maybe they'll visit the government website. But they've never been through the process themselves. They've never tested it. They don't know what it's really like. Um, I am actually out here on a daily basis, constantly trying things, testing things, opening bank accounts, opening new companies, getting immigration, second passports, uh, buying foreign real estate, new gold vaults, uh, investing, investing in hedge funds, investing in all this stuff. I always put my money where my mouth is on this types of stuff. I actually have a lot of competitors and competitors that you would know if you heard the name, if I said it right now, I'm not going to, but if you heard their name, you would know exactly who they are. I constantly see people copying my work. Because I actually do this myself, they, they know and trust me, so therefore they just copy my types of things. But a lot of trends, a lot of places where people start to go, you know, they start talking about it, but they haven't been them, there themselves. They know that I've been there and I recommend it, now they start recommending it. So I guess that, you know, what's the saying? Uh, uh, Copying is the, the greatest uh, form of flattery in the world. I can't remember exactly how it does. I completely butchered that. Um, yeah, I think it's cute sometimes. Other times it's like, come on, guys, do your own work. Uh, but it is what it is. I can't stop anyone. But yeah, there's a lot of people out there who copy my work. I guess I should be flattered. Um, I would like it if they would cite me sometimes or link back to me or link back to myself or give me credit. Anyways, I am here in Brazil. I'm actually doing this myself. I'm actually going through this process. Um, we're going to be buying real estate here. I've done some videos on YouTube talking about the areas that I like in Brazil. I've talked about the safety. We were talking, you know, there's a lot of people who say, oh, Brazil is not so safe. You can't be just recommending Brazil in general. I'm not recommending Brazil in general. I think Brazil is an amazing place, but there are safe spots and there are not safe spots. I am in Florianopolis. Uh, today I'm staying in Canis. I'm at my Airbnb. I'm on my beach. I hope the wind is not too much today, but I don't know if you guys can see, but right over here is the ocean. Right back there, I'm, I'm pointing. If you guys are listening to the audio, you won't see this, obviously, but the ocean is right there. It's about... 20 meters out my back door, maybe 15 meters out my back door. I'm in Canis right now. I'm right next to Jodoré. We were staying in Jodoré before. We're trying out a new neighborhood. 
This is our fourth Airbnb, fourth or fifth Airbnb in the six months that we're here. I'm gonna be doing separate videos, talking about what I've learned living in a Airbnb for the last six months straight, uh, things that you guys wanna consider. We'll be putting out a video about that. So if you go to expatmoneyshow.com forward slash YouTube, you'll be able to get that one. All right, Brazil. What else can I tell you about Brazil? So yes, not everything is safe in Brazil. I understand that. Uh, where I am, I have no problem with recommending the safety. I think it's extraordinarily safe. I think it's a beautiful spot. Uh, the people here are amazing. Okay, I've been to 106 countries in my life. I counted 106 countries. And Brazil is like super special. The people here will go out of their way to make friends with you and genuinely make friends with you, to really want to get to know you, to, to learn about your life and your culture, about your food. They are so happy to share about their culture and language and history. And, you know, they're very upfront and candid about their history about the politics, about what they've done well, about what they haven't done, about their love affair with football and soccer, uh, sports, of being outside, and it's unreal. I mean, like I said, I've been here, this is my fifth time now. I'm constantly surprised at how amazing the people here are. They're, they're uh, unreal. So I have three different group of friends. I have a expat group of friends here. They're mostly older expats who have all relocated here. They're all 50, 60 plus, and they're very, very sweet. They get get, to, get together every single Friday. Uh, when we first started going to the group, there was like 20, 25 people. Now it is winter. You'll notice I'm in a sweater. It's quite cool here. Uh, nights, it's going down to like 15, but the daytime might be like 20. It's uh, sunset right now, so it's getting quite cool. So we got that group. I have an amazing group of libertarian friends who are all in and around my age. They're mostly like doctors and stuff like that. Uh, all libertarians. There's a huge libertarian community here in Florianopolis. Um, I've actually made friends with other YouTubers who are libertarians who have channels here who have like half a million subscribers or something. And they were telling me that the majority of their subscribers or the highest concentration of their subscribers are in... Santa Catarina in this state and specifically in Florianopolis. So I thought that was really interesting. So I'm, I'm looking at ways where I can bring down other libertarians here um, to Florianopolis to start either a digital nomad community or, or some type of a, a group and a friendship here because there's so many amazing people. And then I have another group of friends that I just got recently connected with. It's like a WhatsApp group with a couple hundred expats, expats and locals. And they get together and they play like beach tennis or volleyball or uh, football and stuff like that. So I, I think that's quite good tier as well. So a lot of community, a lot of friends. I'm a really outgoing person. I like to meet people. I like to talk, obviously. I like to talk. Otherwise, I wouldn't have a podcast. And, uh, and that's been good. Okay, I'm, I'm looking here at my next screen. I got lots of notes here. Food, Brazil. Wow, amazing. So we've been eating churrasco, like Brazilian barbecue. I mean, we used to eat this in Panama. It's one of my favorite places, like once a month on special occasions. We're eating it like three, four times a week here. We're either cooking at the house and we're bringing over a half a dozen, a dozen friends to cook for, or we're going out to restaurants or we're doing it on the beach we rented a, a huge five bedroom beach house and did churrasco in the backyard on the beach one time. Uh, it's amazing. I love it. You, you're having lamb and different cuts of beef and chicken and chicken hearts and uh, organ meat and like so many different cool food. And the Brazilians are like really passionate about it. They, uh, we met my one friend's uh, dad and he was, you know, in his community is really famous for doing churrasco. So he wanted to cook churrasco for me and my wife and my, my family. So he came over and we had a huge party with lots of drinks and 10, 15 people and cooked all day long. We start at noon and we go until 10 o'clock at night and we do, you know, all day food. That's been amazing. When we go out for the food, it is really affordable. 
So I guess a few years ago, the price of the Hiai was a lot more on parity with the US dollar. But right now, it's at the absolute worst spot it's ever been, which is great as a tourist coming in. Um, you know, not great for the locals, no comment on that, but I earn mostly US dollars, so coming into the country bringing US dollars, things are really affordable. So I did an email recently. We went out for dinner. It was amazing. The, the restaurant was in a really nice area, and we had drove past it a couple of times. It looked like a really special place. So I was with my friends, and we popped by, and we're going to bring, I don't know, maybe six or eight of us for dinner. And he's like, no, we're only open for takeaway. We're not open for the general public right now. So we're, we're asking lots of questions. Well, what about the beef and why this and blah, blah, blah. And my friend, Brazilian friend, starts saying, oh, you know, this guy has a, a, a big following. You know, millions of people read his work and listen to his podcast every year. You know, you should, you know, let him in. So the guy convinced <laughs> my friend convinced him. I was kind of laughing, you know, in the background. But they opened the restaurant for us. We came in. We ate so much food. We were there for two, three hours. Uh, bottles of wine. We're drinking San Pellegrino. My kid and my my wife are drinking fresh juices. Uh, all this steak, everything like that. I get the bill. It's like a hundred and three U.S. dollars or something. I think it was like six adults and a kid. I can't remember exactly for a hundred bucks. But the meat is amazing. It's all free range. They were telling us how the cows graze on these. 3,000 different types of clovers and botanicals and grasses, which makes the meat way more healthy. And then the meat has omega-3s instead of omega-6s and 9s, which can cause inflammation. Omega-3 fatty acids actually reduce inflammation in the body. Anyways, he had this whole big story. I actually want to do a YouTube video about it because it was so super interesting. But yeah, it was like 100 bucks for six, seven people with wine, with dessert, with everything. Um, that was an amazing experience. We go out for buffet dinners uh, here or, or our lunches. We drive down the street three, four minutes and they do barbecue and all you can eat buffet. And it's $4.50 for the for per person. And then like maybe a buck for your drink. Your beverages are mostly like a dollar, a dollar for a fresh juice, maybe a dollar for uh, a beer or something like that, or a buck 50 for a glass of wine. So really, really affordable prices here. Um, the The cost of living is is all around. It's quite good. We rented a car. We've got uh, we've had a car for about two months now. I want to say, I mean, it's not a sports car by any means. It's like a normal SUV type of vehicle. We're filling up gas once every two weeks. We drive it every single day. We're always exploring different areas. We're going to look at different real estate. So it's about $50, $60 for your gas for the month, which I think is quite okay. We're filling it up twice a month. Uh, Florianopolis is not a huge place, so it's, uh, it's quite easy to get along here. The roads are very narrow, but the traffic is not too much, at least in off season. I've heard it can be really, really bad in um, peak tourist season. So I can't really comment on that, but that's what I've heard. Uh, the languages. All right, next. Languages. Before I came here, people told me, ah, everybody speaks Spanish. You'll be fine. You know, I speak fluent Spanish. I thought, I thought it would be okay. So I started out by asking people, like, do you speak Spanish? Hablas Español. Do you speak English? They always say no. The response is no, 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 no. Um, that made things very difficult at first. So what I found is... Don't ask them if they speak Spanish. Just if you speak Spanish, just speak Spanish to them and they will understand in a lot of cases. It's not like, I mean, 100% by any means, but I'll give you an example. So I was with my buddy. Uh, we're sitting at the beach and we'd been drinking. We're drinking caparinas all day. and We're pretty wasted at this point. It's, you know, my Sunday afternoon. I'm taking some time off and uh, we're having a few drinks. And we thought it would be pretty funny if we could do a test. So the test was I would speak to him only in Spanish and he would speak to me only in Portuguese. We were going to see if we could have a conversation. Well, we talked for like probably almost an hour back and forth. 
And he understood what I was saying and I understood what he was saying. Not perfect, not word by word. I couldn't translate for you exact word. It's not all the nuances, but enough to have a conversation, to understand what the topic was, to make your opinion known, to make your opinion um, understood. This worked. And when I switched to this here in Brazil, it's happened, it's helped a lot. Um, you know, we're with our Brazilian friends, so they're, be able, they're able to translate certain things. I'm hiring some people here in Brazil, so they're going to help, be able to help. But with normal things like going to the restaurant or getting directions or filling up gas, if you speak Spanish, fine, speak Spanish. If you speak English, it's, not probably, it's probably not as good, but you can probably still get by because they do speak a little bit of English, even if they say they don't. Okay, anyways, next. Uh, so those are the main things that I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, I'm going to do an entire video on Airbnbs, what I've learned for Airbnb. We talked about the food. We talked about the booze. We talked about car rental. We talked about gas. We talked about language. We talked about people. We talked about culture, history, um, the weather. I mean, it's very hot and humid here during the summer where I am right now. I'm in the very, very south. It's very, very cold here. It's getting cold like literally right now. Uh, so I'm going to try to wrap this up in the next couple of minutes. But um, the the landscape here is amazing. The beaches are out of this world. I'm going to film some of that. Maybe we can edit it into this so you can see the, the beaches. Uh, soon we head back to Panama. We're getting prepared for that. Uh, there's been some massive changes to the Friendly Nations visa in Panama. I think I'm going to have to do an entirely separate video about that. Um, but basically in a nutshell, what has happened is they've taken it from a $5,000 real estate and sorry, a $5,000 bank deposit and a company formation to a $200,000 real estate investment, or you can hold money in the bank account. It's also $200,000. There's other, some, there's some other nuances there that have changed. Now it's a temporary residency for the first two years. Then you reapply for your permanent residency. It used to be a temp card for the first three to four months, then no need to reapply. You were automatically put in as a permanent residency. Uh, but now you have to do a separate application. It is what it is. I had tons of people last year who commented to me that I was, oh, you know, sensationalizing this and creating gossip and marketing, that there's going to be no changes to the friendly nations visa, that uh, I'm just working on scarcity. And, you know, they've not heard anything. And I'm the only person talking about the changes to the Friendly Nations visa. Well, I can tell you that I had people from other organizations that, uh, that you probably already know the name of who reached out to me separately. And I told them, no, this is real. It's really happening. And then they went forward and told their people about it. So I actually had some of my other competitors ask me, is this true or not? I told them, yes, it is true. It is happening. This is how I know. These are the rumors. This is what's going to happen. Okay, they're great. I actually had subscribers who made comments on me that I was just doing marketing ploys here and manufactured scarcity. I wasn't. I don't do this type of stuff. I don't just sensationalize this for no reason. I was talking last year about it because I'm very well connected in Panama. I live in Panama full time. I mean, I keep a home there. We have our permanent residency there. I have lots of friends who are connected to the government. I know some of the most prominent families there. We know a lot of the government officials there. We're just really well connected and we heard all the rumors. I knew that this was coming and I started warning people about it last year. And sure enough, it happened. Mid this year, they announced that they were going to be changing all the Friendly Nations visa. Now, there's a huge rush of people who want to get it done. Well, guys, when I make a comment that things are going to change or you need to take advantage of these things right now, please, please, please listen to me. Trust me. I hope that after five years of doing this, of the podcast and the newsletter and all this stuff, that I've built up enough trustworthiness and credibility that you will just take my advice next time. Start these things early. Immigration takes a long period of time. Even look at what's happening to me in Brazil right now. We've been here for six months to do our residency, and now I have to come back in a year from now to finish it up. Okay? So, please, listen to me. I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm well connected. I don't say this stuff just off the cuff. I don't say this out of nowhere. I have a reason for saying it. I'm looking out for you. I have your best interests at heart. Yes, I run it as a business, but my reputation is everything to me. That is my business. 
So anyways, that's all I'm going to comment on the Panama Friendly Nations visa. I'm really excited to head back to Panama. I'm actually excited to go back to the warm weather again. Um, it's hot and humid there, but I'm looking forward to it. Uh, my daughter wants to play with all her stuff. We were actually... My daughter and my mother stayed in Panama for the first couple of months that we came down here to Brazil. But after the birth, we sent for them. So they've been here for the last little while. So reunited with my daughter. Thank goodness being separated from her was super, super difficult. So we'll all be going back as a family. And it's good. It's another chance for her to learn another language as well as see another country. So this is her 13th country she's been to at five years old. And now she's starting to learn um, Brazilian Portuguese so that's her fourth language she's also getting going to get her permanent residency here so lots of family things I think that's another big difference between the work that I do and a lot of the work that other people do is I am not a single guy here I'm not hanging out with uh, you know I'm, I'm not a digital nomad in my early 20s doing this and I have no responsibilities I'm almost 40 I have a lot of responsibilities. I have a family that I travel with, happily married man with kids. So I think that that's a big difference. I don't think anyone else in my space is in this same type of situation that I'm in. So if you are a, if you have your own family, if you're married, if you have kids, then probably a lot of the information that I work with and the, the things that happen to me are going to be more applicable to you than um, if you're like 19 years old or 20 some odd years old. Not to say that I don't want you guys following my content. I do. I absolutely do. But I think that a lot of the things that I'm doing, especially going forward with the education, with the school, uh, with people who have a little bit more money who can invest in real estate is going to be more geared towards the, the, the family type of person. I'm very family orientated. I'm very down to earth. I'm very, uh, first of all, I use my own real name in this. This is my real face. I want to shine a light on the offshore space. I don't want to make this a dodgy thing. This is not all underground. This is, this is my life and I have very legitimate and honest and ethical reasons for going offshore, for paying zero taxes. And I'm building all of my business and I want to help you guys to do the same. So that's it. That is episode 150 in the bag. We have some amazing content coming up in the next couple of months. I really hope that you guys get a chance to hear all of that. Um, if you guys can, please subscribe to the new YouTube channel. I've already given you the link a couple of times, but it's expatmoneyshow.com forward slash YouTube. Join the forum, expatmoneyforum.com. You guys can pick up my book, Expat Secrets. Uh, support the show that money goes back into the podcast to develop the podcast to pay for the editors everything like that it's all reinvested it's expat expatsecretsbook.com expatsecretsbook.com please support the show uh, grab the book and then leave us a five-star review if you like the book i really appreciate it i read all of those um, i think that that's an amazing way that you guys can give back if you want to find out more information about the school then send me an email at Mikkel at expatmoney.io. When the new website is open, then I will send that out on the newsletter. And that's it. I hope you guys enjoyed. I try to be as upfront and honest with you as possible. And yeah, I'll see you in the next episode. Okay, bye.